So welcome everyone to the STEM talk session 11 of the seven Polygen Symposium of Rising Scholars. My name is Ramona and I will be moderating today's session. The goal of the symposium is to celebrate and showcase the hard work of our Polygen scholars, all of whom have tirelessly worked on their presentations over the past couple of months. We have four students presenting on a variety of topics today. A fellow member of the Polygen's team will scoring each student's presentation, which will help us determine prize winners after the event. Um, please type your questions in the Q&A if you have any questions for each speaker. We will have time after the end of each session for the speakers to answer your questions. Today's speakers are Olivia, Connor, Samin, and Tiffany. Um, so, Olivia, I will let you sh sh share your screen and uh, you can start. Um, before you start, do you have any questions or anything? No? Okay. Then everyone else, please turn off your camera so Olivia can share her screen and be the main person. You can start, Olivia. Hello everyone, my name is Olivia Morrissey and today I will be telling you about the applications of in vivo bioprinting in coordination with robot assisted surgery with, for musculoskeletal tissue repairs. What is the musculoskeletal system and robot assisted surgery? The musculoskeletal system, also known as the MSK, helps the body function through supporting the body as it moves through connections between the skeletal the skeleton and the muscles. This picture shows this shows the different parts of the musculoskeletal system, which are the bones, the cartilage, the ligaments, the tendons, and the muscle fibers. Since our bodies are constantly moving and stress is put on the musculoskeletal system, injuries regularly occur. There are two different types of injuries that can occur. One is blunt force trauma. This is when an object or person strikes the body, causing the inj causing injury. This is most common in sports when the, when the strike of an object or person causes unwanted stress to be put on different parts of the musculoskeletal system. The other type of trauma is penetrated force trauma. This is when penetration to the musculoskeletal system causes a wound. This is most common during traumatic events such as car accidents. If an injury to the musculoskeletal system is serious and cannot be fixed naturally, Surgery to repair the injury, along with physical therapy to safely reintroduce physical activity is necessary. Musculoskeletal surgery can have different complications, such as bleeding due to surgery near highly vascularized tissue, secondary illnesses such as compartment syndrome, injury to other parts of the musculoskeletal system due to new st stress from the surgical procedure, and re-injury from introduction of physical activity too early. Surgery to the musculoskeletal system is usually a long process due to the need for grafts from other musculoskeletal tissue to be used in the repair. One common technique for musculoskeletal surgery is an arthro arthroscopy. This is where a small incision is made and an arthroscope, which is a camera attached to a tube, is inserted for a surgeon to gain a better view for the injured area. Arthroscopic surgery can have a comp can have complications, including infection, nerve damage caused by the arthroscope, and blood clots. Robot-assisted surgery is the use of a robot to conduct aspects of the surgical procedure. Robot-assisted surgery has many benefits, including more accurate placement of implants and a decrease of effect in infection rate. What is 3D printing and bioprinting? 3D printing is a type of additive manufacturing where freestanding structures are printed by a print head positioning itself to print the structure layer by layer. 3D printing has already been implemented in different manufacturing businesses, such as consumer goods and automobile parts. Bioprinting is the use of 3D printing techniques and biomaterial that is made of living cells to create 3D structures. Bioinks are used in the printer in the printing process. Biolinks are made of cells and biomaterials that allow the cells to function and stay alive during the 
printing process. Bioprinting is currently being implemented in many different areas of research. In vitro bioprinting, bioprinting that happens outside of the body, has been able to print tissue models in order to expand disease cells and create microenvironments to study these cells, which eliminates the need for biopsy or animals to test on. Also, organs have been printed to test new biolink formulas and to be used in drug testing. Bioprinting that occurs inside the body is known as in vivo bioprinting. In vivo bioprinting has become a current, a current common goal for many researchers in this field. One study that uses in vivo bioprinting to print new osteochondral tissue for mice. What are some in vivo bioprinting techniques? Many factors go into making in vivo bioprinting successful. The most important factors are the printing tissue, the printing technique, the biolinks used, and the cell type that is used while printing. Many different printing systems for in vivo bioprinting has been developed and tested. One of the most successful systems is extrusion-based bioprinting. Some pros of extrusion-based printing is the, that it allows for multiple print heads to be attached and operates at high cell densities. Some problems do occur with this system. One example is the pressure that is put on the biolinks due to the extrusion system's pressure and the low viscosity of the biolink causing cells to die while printing. This problem can be solved by the use of nanoclay to increase the viscosity of the biolink. This will enhance the printability and cytocompatibility of the biolink. This diagram shows the process of extrusion-based printing and the different mechanisms that can be used to extrude the biolink. Biolinks commonly provide scaffolding and create a viable environment for cells to live in while printing. One main per parameter for biolinks is that it needs to be able to be printed at a temperature lower than the body. Biolinks are usually chosen to ensure the cell stays intact and alive during the printing process and, have, and has high print resolution. This means that the printed material will stay in place and print accurately. Having high print resolution allows for the biolink to have fast cross-linking capabilities. There are different components to biolinks. One of the main components is the use of the extracellular matrix. The extracellular matrix provides the tissue and cells the structure needed for them to connect and reproduce through a network of proteins. Natural polymers like collagen are used with hydrogels or decellularized extracellular matrices to create the environment of a natural extracellular matrix. Hydrogels are used in the extracellular matrix in order to pro provide the cell with high water content during printing. Lastly, the cross-linking process is important to induce the gelation of the hydrogels in the biolink, creating a strong surface, a strong structure during and after printing. Cross-linking can happen in many different ways, such as the addition of solutions containing ions like CaCl2, or the, induction, the introduction of ultraviolet light. The correct cell type for the specific part of the body is needed in order to regenerate the tissue. Stem cells are usually used due to the versatility and self-renewing properties of them as cells. This table shows the main cell types in the musculoskeletal system, what part of the musculoskeletal system they are found in, what their progenitor cell is, and the potential injuries they can be used to fix through, the, through in vivo bioprinting. how in vivo bioprinting is currently being applied. In a study about finding, fixing volumetric muscle loss in rabbits through in vivo bioprinting, biolink containing Gelma hydrogel and laprinite nanoplay was printed onto the rabbit's injured muscles. The result of the study concluded that the biolink decreased the fibrosis of, a mu of the muscles and increased the hydrosis. These results allow the muscle tissue to regenerate faster, at a faster rate due to the decrease of scarring on the tissue. How can robot-assisted surgery be implemented in in vivo bioprinting? 
One of the most important factors of robot-assisted surgery is how minimally invasive the procedures are. For example, the da Vinci surgical system allow, uses a first access accessory point shown in the photo. This point, allow, this point acts as an anchor point where multiple tools can enter the surgical area. This could be utilized with in vivo bioprinting through the creation of a series of attachments, including a print head, a cross-linking machine, and a camera that encapsulate the in vivo bioprinting process. Surgical planning technology can also be utilized to rule out complications that can happen during surgery. Technology such as the Navio surgical system that is shown uses bone mapping to see the current state of a patient's surgical area and allows the surgeon to manipulate different factors of the implant's orientation to change different factors in the outcome of the surgery, such as the range of motion the patient will have. Lastly, existing surgical attachments can be used, can be utilized during the in vivo bioprinting process. The forcep detachment shown can be utilized to maneuver around organs during surgery. Using extrusion-based bioprinting, a combination of digital imaging and robotic equipment, in vivo bioprinting in the musculoskeletal system could become a minimally invasive surgery with greater results than the traditional surgical methods. An example of a surgery that can benefit from this implementation of in vivo bioprinting is, the, is an ACL reconstruction surgery. Commonly, this surgery consists of pulling gra a graft from a muscle, such as the hamstring. The graft acts as a tendon as it connects the bone to the muscle through holes in the femur and the tibia. This graft is used as a scaffold for a new ACL to develop on. By implementing in vivo bioprinting, in this procedure, there would be no use for the hamstring graft. BioLink would be extruded straight into the site through the anchor point holes in the femur and the tibia. An extrusion-based bioprinting system could be used as a series of attachments on a robotic-assisted surgery machine. These attachments could include one for extruding BioLink, one for cross-linking BioLink through UV light or the addition of solutions containing ions, and one that has a camera for the surgeon to be able to see the surgical site. This photo shows a concept of what an in vivo bioprinting machine with the use of robotic assisted surgery could look like. Thank you. Thank you, Olivia. That was a great presentation. Um, attendees, if you have any questions, please write in the Q&A. Until we wait, I'm just going to ask that what was the the hardest part of your uh, of your research? Because to me, it it seems very complicated and very complex. Um, I can imagine how it can be for you, but I guess you are in the field, so. I think the hardest part was kind of figuring out like what I wanted my product to exactly be, because I knew I wanted to do something with um robotic assisted surgery and I think that's very interesting but also I found in vivo bioprinting very interesting so combining these two topics was difficult but in the end it ended up working out and I really like the project I ended with yeah and we got a question uh how are surgeons making sure that the cross-linking of these bioprints does not cross-link inappropriate parts of the body so the cross-linking that is used um, usually only works on the printed bioinks, so it won't really um, cross-link the other parts of the body, only the bioinks that are being used. Okay. Well, thank you, Olivia. Um, just to make sure that we have enough time, we will move on. And just give me a second. Our next presenter will be Connor. Connor, if you could please share your screen.
Okay, hi. My name is Connor Kim, and I recently worked on a, re a rhetorical research project analyzing the high pharmaceutical drug prices in America. The inspiration for this project came from a pilot study I conducted with my mentor, Minsip Lee, in which we asked the public why they thought drug prices were so expensive. As seen by the study, 11% thought it was because of patent protection privilege, 11% thought it was because of a lack of governmental intervention, 64% thought it was because of corporate greed and pricing power, and 14% thought it was because of the high cost of research and distribution. This paper aims to analyze how each different element of the pharmaceutical industry works together to contribute to the overall rising of drug prices in America. The United States of America has been the dominant global economic superpower since the 1920s. Unfortunately, the wealth gap between the wealthy and the poor has been widening faster than ever. As of January 2019, over 58 million American households could not pay for prescribed medication over a 12-month time period. And as of 2021, about 66% of Americans live in constant fear of being unable to afford health care. During this time, drug prices increase at an average rate of 7% per year, and by 2030, it is forecasted that nearly 112,000 seniors could die prematurely because they are unable to afford high drug prices. This raises a key question. Why is medication and healthcare so expensive in the United States? Let's take insulin, for example. The average cost of insulin is $98.7 in the United States. However, it can cost upwards of $175 to $300 per vial. Most patients with type 1 diabetes consume between two to three vials per month, which means it can cost as high as $900 per month. This is a sharp contrast to countries such as Norway, which the exact same insulin costs as little as $7.79 per vial. How does it make sense that a nation with the largest economic superpower is failing to protect the lives of millions of American people? How is a country with a substantially lower G GDP per capita, like Norway, able to achieve these prices? When approaching this issue, it's important to not only know the full context of the issue, but to also tackle the root of the problem. The purpose of this presentation is to, uh, is to explore the fundamental roots of the problem behind the inflated drug prices in a, log in a logistical and analytical fashion. One of the themes of this article is how Big Pharma used psychology to, um, to their advantage to change the mindset and propel the market for elevated drug prices, and more, most importantly, why the consumers are still paying for these prices. When discussing why drug prices are so high, there are five key factors that we must consider. The high cost of research and development, the overwhelming demand for drugs, the lack of governmental regulation, patent protection privileges, and fragmented health insurance policies. Research and development. The average cost of drug development by a single drug company is around $350 million. And as of 2020, the global spending of drug research has reached $226 billion and is projected to reach $254 billion by 2026. The high cost associated with research and development is one of the many reasons as to why it is becoming increasingly difficult to stabilize drug prices in the United States. Overwhelming demand. Another driving factor for the increase in drug prices is the overwhelming demand for drugs. Metabolic dysfunctions such as diabetes and obesity have been breaking new records each year. Because of this, these uptrending statistics, consumer demand for drugs and medication has been growing substantially. Yet the production has not been keeping pace with consumer demand, which naturally drives up the cost for these goods. This increased demand for drugs as well as constant increase in drug prices due to the supply and demand lead to a never ending cycle of increasing drug prices that seem to have no end in sight. Lack of regulation. Increase in drug prices is also associated with the lack of governmental intervention. Without intervention, the government companies are able to exploit vulnerable people needing medication by forcing them to pay for high drug prices with no real repercussion of consequences. Moreover, without the regulation of drug prices by the government, there is no price ceiling on drugs, making it impossible to tell how drug prices, how high drug prices will eventually get. Intellectual property. Many monopolies in the pharmaceutical industry gained their power through patent protections. Patent protections were created by the government as a way to temporarily obtain a licensing to a title or right. However, over the last decade, they have evolved into a vehicle for companies to gain full control over a certain medication. This high barrier for entry discourages new companies from coming into the space, decreasing innovation and technology aimed to keep patients healthy. Fragmented insurance policies. Fragmented health insurances imply that companies are not willing to coordinate with each other in order to help cover certain costs to save money for the average American patient. And as a result, many people do not receive coverage on the medication they need and treatments they require to stay healthy. This separation in the healthcare system is one of the, main, 
one of the main reasons as to why the United States fails to achieve this goal and consequently allow high drug prices to, to persist. Commonly proposed solutions. The most commonly proposed solutions are government, to, government industry partnerships, which allow companies to work together funded by the government while regulating drug prices. An example of this is Operation Warp Speed, in which the US government was, be, was able to produce the COVID-19 vaccine in a little over a year. Price concessions, which provide incentives for consumers to purchase medications through tax deductions and tax credits, and monopoly busting, which would put heavy regulations on extending and creating patent protection. The psychological problem. These solutions, although promising, are missing one key aspect. Why do consumers and producers make the decisions they are making to create the problem we are currently facing? Why does the pharmaceutical system seem so one-sided in favor of the producers? All these questions can be answered with the decisions these companies make to psychologically influence their consumers. The major pharmaceutical company use many different strategies, including credibility and advertising, perceived scarcity, and consumer adaptation. Credibility. One strategy that pharmaceutical companies will use in order to not only increase sales, but to raise prices on their products is to use credibility for their products to their advantage. Credibility is a psychological strategy that relies on the reputation and image in order to better market their products. Some methods of gaining credibility is stating the efficacy of the product, as well as comparing it to competing brands. This draws customers to their products under the assumption that there is only one right choice when it comes to choosing what medication to purchase. Consumer adaptation. One reason as to why the drug one reason as to why prices of drugs continue to increase is that consumer demand for these products not changed despite the increase in drug prices. Drugs are an inelastic good, which means that the quantity of the, of the product does not, influence, does not influence the price of the product that they are selling. For individuals who rely on medications such as insulin, their demand for these drugs are extremely high. Therefore, drug prices are constantly in, in experiencing inflationary pressures because consumer demand are constantly increasing. We can think of this as a positive feedback loop, which high consumer demand leads to higher drug prices, which is further amplified by the perpetual increase in consumer demand. Urgency scarcity. Another psychological strategy that companies exploit in order to gain more revenue is urgency scarcity. Urgency scarcity is most commonly used by companies in order to make consumers think they need to buy the product due to the limited nature of the product. Obtaining insulin is urgent for many Americans and their life depends on it. However, only three companies produce insulin in the United States. Novo Nordis, Sinopoli, and Eli Lilly. With the pattern protections, these monopolies will stand for years to come and the people are left powerless. Moreover, the people are unable to protest and boycott the products because the consumers cannot stop taking insulin. This is why the pharmace pharmaceutical company feels so one-sided. Due to the inelastic nature of medication, the consumers have little power to change the drug prices. Increasing sales of insulin should not be an indicator to raise prices and most pharmaceutical companies are um, most pharmaceuticals are necessary in order to protect the lives of many Americans. This last portion of my presentation will cover the most crucial aspect of how companies have so much power over the decisions we make, as well as the power we have when it comes to pricing power. It's acceptance and lower helplessness. Over the last decade, people have been trained by the pharmaceutical company to accept the high prices of drugs. Acceptance is used as a psychological strategy in order to control consumers and make them believe they have no power in order to influence the market. It creates a scenario where people are trained to feel helpless in the struggle for medication and fair pricing. Many solutions to this issue are out of reach with many requiring a complete systematic shift in a system that has been active for over hundreds of years. Other solutions require companies and people to see eye to eye uh, on basic issues which rely people to compromise, which is unforeseeable in the future of America. The solution to this issue is education. Educating the youth as well as active citizens in the United States about the current state of the pharmaceutical industry, as well as the necessary steps we need in order to resolve this issue. Accepting, the is accepting these realities is what companies want. By fighting the price of basic human goods, you are helping save the lives of millions of people. The complex relationship between producer and consumer has influenced conflict between many mainstream media, with many politicians and government leaders quickly to blame Big Pharma for the high prices of drugs. However, the research in this paper suggests otherwise. In fact, some people would argue that the politicians blaming these companies are part of the problem. Not only are they shifting the blame to avoid confrontation, but they are spreading false information and slowing the process to tackling the true issue of the pharmaceutical industry. Moreover, it raises the question, are government officials enabling these high drug prices by shifting, the, uh, shifting blame and avoiding the true issues um, of this problem? However, in the grand scheme of things, politicians represent only a small issue in a much bigger problem. Oftentimes, the reason as to why we cannot 
effectively create a solution and achieve great things is a lack of compromise with, a, with opinions shifting from the key questions as to why the, this problem exists in the first place. In every single aspect, we have the ability to solve this issue, however, we refuse to do so because of our opinions. Although there are many issues with the system that we have discussed in this paper, the true issue lies with the people who refuse to educate themselves about the current status of the industry. However, the solution lies with the people as well. By, the, by, um, by working collectively towards a goal, we can truly achieve great things. If you take one thing away from this presentation, it is this key idea. You can truly make a difference by empowering yourself and the people around you. By making educated decisions and not falling victim to the psychological strategies being used by the various companies, you can play a necessary role in reclaiming control over the pharmaceutical industry together. Thank you for your time. Wow, another interesting presentation. Great work. Thank you. Attendees, again, if you have any questions, please. Um, okay, we already have one. Um, Connor from Courtney. What do you think the single most effective strategy to lower drug prices in the US? Um, like I stated um, previously in my presentation, many people have various solutions which are um, which are not possible with the current state of the government. Um, many solutions that are being proposed are just simply impossible because of the lack of compromise. Um, so I believe that the only way in order to lower the drug prices is to educate um, people who are being taken advantage of in order to stand up to these drug prices. And another question, what was the most, I would say, unexpected thing you learned during this research? The most unexpected thing is that many um, people are quick to blame Big Pharma for the high pricing of drugs. However, um, during the presentation, uh, I was very interested to find that um, that isn't the full story. You know, there are problems on both sides, but um, the 64%, which state that um, the monopolies were the so re the sole reason of the problem were, um, were wrong. And that was very surprising to me. Um, I, I was under that 64% as well. Thank you, Connor. Our next presenter will be Samin. I will add you to the spotlight. Just give me a second. Okay. Share my screen. Yep, you can start now. Hi, my name is Samin Ahmed, and my project is about developing Coronas, which is a wearable device that can monitor the onset of COVID-19 by recording, by recording changes in one's vital signs that are most indicative of the virus. So here is some background information. Over the course of the pandemic, hospitals nationwide have spent more than $3 billion for personal protective equipment also known as PPE. This is because nurses and hospital staff typically check each of their patient's vital signs once, if not several times throughout the day. Workers are required to suit themselves in a new set of standardized attire before recording the vital signs of patients. This rapidly exhausts the supply of PPE in hospitals and increases their demand, leading hospitals to develop a significant amount, leading hospitals to spend a significant amount of money on supplies. These conditions are even more strained in underdeveloped countries due to economic inequality and insufficient infrastructure. So the four main vital signs that are typically checked uh, include heart rate, respiratory rate, temperature, and blood pressure. So heart rate is typically taken by gently pressing one's finger on the patient's neck and by using a thesoscope. Electrocardiogram tests have also been developed, which measure the heart's electrical signals through sensors placed on the chest produced when the heart beats. Respiratory rate is measured by counting the amount of times the chest rises and falls when the patient is at rest. Blood pressure is most commonly measured using an aneroid monitor or a device that consists of an inflatable cuff wrapped around the arm of the patient. To record temperature, hospitals have used electronic thermometers that are typically placed in the mouth or ear but also a non-contact method has been popularized that uses infrared sensors. So in order to solve the issues that I mentioned in the previous slides, many companies have developed wearable devices that can monitor vital signs or other health features. While wearable devices have been popularized, these devices often face several problems. For example, 
Wrist heart rate sensors are often disrupted due to the effects of surrounding ambient light entering the optical sensor, which can skew the refracted light, decreasing its accuracy. The wrist is also prone to high optical noise, low blood perfusion, and is highly susceptible to motion artifacts due to hand movements. Most prominently, wrist wearable devices are significantly less accurate for darker skin colors because they usually rely on emitting a green light and it's more readily absorbed by melanin, which causes inaccurate readings. Also, um, a similar issue is absorbed by individuals with a higher body mass, mass index as thicker skin layers lead to higher signal loss. Here, the creation of a wearable device that can autonomously measure the vitals of hospital patients that are most indicative of the onset of COVID-19 was investigated. The device would take the form of a wrist and finger monitor capable of recording the heart rate, blood oxygen saturation, and temperature of patients in a non-invasive manner. Through extensive research, I chose these three vital signs because they show to be most indicative of COVID-19. These sensors would then record the data in a web application for workers to monitor, which can easily be shared using a Bluetooth connection. So here is my process for my project thus far, but since it's still continuing, there's definitely a lot more steps to go. But it started off with designing, building, followed by programming. So prior to construction, I began to brainstorm how I wanted my device to look. I determined that in order to achieve more accurate results, that the finger should be a place for measuring heart rate and oxygen saturation due to high blood perfusion. These sensors will also be connected to an LCD display located at the wrist to provide readings of one's vital signs. At the wrist, the temperature sensors would be embedded. I chose not to embed the temperature sensors at the fingertips because many reports claim that temperature taken at the body's extremities aren't as accurate, uh, and they are an accurate a representation of one's core body temperature. The information presented in the LCD display will also be available for distance monitoring through an app which relies on Bluetooth connection. So here are the electronics that I used. The main modules I'm using at the moment include my Arduino Uno, a MAX3102 sensor, and the MCP9808 temperature sensor. The MAX3102 sensor consists of a photo detector and can output red and infrared light. Red and infrared light is less biased against darker skin tones since it penetrates skin more effectively, but the drawbacks is that it is more susceptible to movement. Here I'll elaborate more on why green light poses an issue, all of which is dependent on the concept of photoplasmography or PPG, which I'll explain in the next slide. I also use the MCP9808 temperature sensor notable for its accuracy within 0.25 degrees Celsius and its range of negative 40 to 125 degrees Celsius. So what is PPG? So photoplasmography technology measures heart rate by emitting light that interact with the blood cells and reflects into a photo detector to provide a reading. In agreement with Beer Lambert's law, more light is absorbed at increased volumes of blood. Therefore, less light is reflected and received by the photo detector and vice versa. As the heart pumps, the sensor picks up on the changes in reflectance, creating a pattern used to depict heart rate. For pulse oximetry, or measuring SpO2, or blood oxygen saturation, the sensor calculates the ratio between the amount of red and infrared light absorbed. Red light is absorbed more readily by deoxygenated blood, while infrared light is absorbed more by oxygenated blood. So here are images of the schematics of the connections of each individual component. Aside from connecting the power and ground, I connected the SCL and SDA pins to A5 and A4 ports on the Arduino Uno, respectively. For the heart rate sensor, the light will begin to shine and you can place your finger over it and receive readings that are present on the serial monitor and or the plotter. So programming I performed using on uh, Arduino IDE using C++. The purpose of this program is to facilitate the sensor to record and process the data. It allows one to adjust the variables of the sensor and performs calculations to display accurate readings. Here's an overview of how the programming works from the sensor's library. After calling the proper libraries, a few lines of code truncate the sample data and defines variables and initializes the serial monitor and the heart rate sensor. The sensor performs calculations to measure the heart rate and blood oxygen saturation until a new sample is collected and the initial values are overridden. The temperature sensor functions similarly. 
though makes calculations to display the temperature in Celsius and Fahrenheit. It also shuts down the sensor every few seconds to reduce power consumption. So here are images that show the blood oxygen saturation readings on the serial monitor and the heart rate graphs on the serial plotter, which is on the bottom of the screen. However, I noticed that the readings would become largely inaccurate and fluctuate frequently if an unideal amount of pressure was applied. Currently, I'm at the stage of understanding how to make the readings more accurate by adjusting the sample average, sample rate, and pulse width variables. So throughout the project, I also face several setbacks and I also have plans to make future improvements. For improvements, I hope to integrate a transmission mode instead of a reflectance mode for my heart rate sensing module. Reflectance mode can cause the light to be more dissipated and is more vulnerable to ambient light than in transmission mode. In transmission mode, the light source and the sensor are placed on opposite sides, so the sensor directly measures a light that isn't absorbed by the finger. I would also be interested in adding additional modules to record more vital signs and to use an Arduino Nano for more compact electronics. One major setback I initially faced was getting the heart rate sensor to work in the first place. I started off with the Max3100 sensor instead of the Max3102 sensor, though the light failed to be emitted and I kept seeing error messages on my serial monitor. I later realized that there were issues within the sensor's board itself because of the connection problems with the pull-up resistors. Then I switched over to my Max3102 sensor, but I ran into similar issues. I attempted soldering as a potential solution to solidify the connections. The entire concept was very new to me, and throughout several, and th and throughout several attempts of trial and error, I not only learned more about the technique, but my sensors also began to work. Here are some benefits of my device potentially. So this device holds prospects for significantly reducing the money spent on supply chain goods for hospitals so that more funds can be allocated towards research. It'll aid in reducing the waste of PPE that are constantly being disposed of to decrease the ecological footprint of hospitals across the world. These items are also most commonly composed of plastic and polyethylene and releases harmful emissions to the environment that can worsen global warming. It will also allow for the early diagnosis of the disease so that proper action can be taken against the virus quickly, saving lives and preventing longer lasting damage. The device is also easily accessible to low income communities and can be easily replicated in a cost effective manner, lessening the economic disparity and the health crisis in developing and underdeveloped nations. For my next steps, I hope to include a display and well first I want to refine the accuracy for both my sensors and ensure that each is operated consistently. Then I plan to use an OLED display connected to each sensor to display my readings. I will also use the HC05 Bluetooth module to create a software which can record the data. I hope to include an alarm which can alert users when one's vital signs reach harmful level levels. Afterwards, I will compare the accuracy of my device with the readings of vitals taken using more traditional ways to identify the standing of my device in the context of existing methods. I'm looking forward to continue working on my project, and I hope that it may have a positive impact on the lives of those affected by the virus. A sincere thank you to my mentor, Cameron, for guiding me throughout my project and for uh, the program coordinators for enabling me to participate in this opportunity. Thank you. Great presentation. Good job. Thank you. Our first question is, who is meant to be wearing these devices? The patients in the hospitals or the hospital staff? So these devices are meant to be worn by the patients, but also individuals who are have a high risk for the virus. They can wear it even though they're not currently infected by the virus. They could wear it at their own home and they could have um, the, their doctors or any hospital staff monitoring it from far away because hospitals are or have been overflowing due to COVID-19. The patients who are in that critical condition can still be monitored and can still receive the same amount of attention but from their own home. Thank you. And the next question is, why do you need two parts of the device? Why not just a single bracelet cuff? 
So I decided to use the um, heart rate sensor and the blood oxygen saturation sensors at the fingertips because they have higher blood perfusion. And at the wrist, even though it's commonly used for a lot of Apple watches or Fitbits, it's not as accurate because there's a low blood perfusion. And if your wrist moves around a lot, it can cause the readings to be inaccurate. So that's why I decided to use to pick the places that would cause for more accurate readings. Thank you so much. Thank you for answering the questions and for your presentation. And our last presenter is going to be Tiffany. Yes. Uh, hello, my name is Tiffany Fan, and I will be presenting on my research on the effects of trauma among Vietnamese Americans. Today, over a million Vietnamese Americans reside in the United States, making up 3% of immigrants in America. The specific circumstances and history of Vietnamese Americans place them at, an ex at a higher risk of experiencing traumatic events. Many first-generation immigrants came to America as a result of the Vietnam War, putting them at risk for war-related trauma in addition to immigrational stressors. Since trauma increases the likelihood of developing psychiatric disorders, such as depression, it is important to understand how trauma affects Vietnamese American immigrant communities and how these effects may trickle down into future generations and so forth. However, research on this community specifically has been minimal so far. Trauma affects the Vietnamese community in many ways. For example, neurologically, Trauma has been proven to increase the likelihood of an individual developing psychiatric disorders, such as acute stress disorder, PTSD, anxiety, and depression. A study held by the Office of Minority Health found that 9% of Asian adults experienced serious psychological distress in 2019, which is related to the development of psychiatric disorders. Intergenerational trauma is also a prevalent issue and occurs when traumatic stress is transmitted from one generation to the next even if that latter generation is not exposed to the initial traumatic event. There are other struggles that can also affect this community. In addition to war-related stressors, immigration and assimilation-related stress can be a source of trauma. This would include economic hardship, cultural differences, and racial discrimination. When doing my research, I first searched the PubMed and Dimensions databases for articles pertaining to Vietnamese American mental health. Articles were included if they discussed war-related, immigrational, or intergenerational trauma, Vietnamese American mental health, or Vietnamese American trauma. Articles were excluded if they focused on the trauma of Vietnamese communities outside of America in order to better focus on the Vietnamese American community. Articles were screened for inclusion by title and abstract using these criteria. Ineligible articles were discarded, and full-text articles were then screened for inclusion. In the end, 12 articles were identified for research. From my research, I found that second generation immigrants and beyond are at risk for mental health issues due to intergenerational trauma. This is partly because stress from traumatic events can be tra transmitted genetically and also through the actions and behaviors of parents. Vietnamese Americans are also prone to underutilizing mental health resources due to the cultural stigma surrounding the concept of mental illness. Mental health issues are equivalated with bad karma from a previous life. As a result, those with mental health issues are often thought of having deserved it. Having these mental health issues would also risk damaging one's reputation within the community. In addition, the cultural focus on self-competency and perseverance prevents people from seeking help. The Vietnamese place an emphasis on being able to solve problems alone, therefore making it difficult for those who do need mental help to get the resources that they need. The reason this issue is so prevalent is because, due to the unique circumstances of this community, trauma becomes a continuous cycle that perpetuates mental health issues within the community. Psychiatric disorders like PTSD can affect an individual's behavior and social relationships, and the effects of traumatic events and intergenerational trauma can also negatively impact familial relationships, continuing the transmission of that intergenerational trauma. In addition, trauma is also transmitted epigenetically. For example, it was shown in one, stu one such study that intergenerational trauma can lead to mitochondrial dysfunction in offspring. This is 
correlated with a lack of energy and an increased risk of depression as well as other mental health issues. By recognizing these barriers that exist within the Vietnamese American community, preventing people from getting the help they need, existing stigmas can slowly be deconstructed and mental health can become more readily available to people who need it. Encouraging discussions and raising awareness about these issues can help combat these stigmas and uh, over time, as the idea of mental health becomes more readily accepted within the community, people will be able to get the help they need, therefore ending the cycle. In conclusion, Vietnamese Americans face many potential sources of trauma, like historical trauma from their immigration in the Vietnam War, negative stigmas surrounding the topic of mental health, social standards turning them away from getting mental health, and cultural ideas of self-competency and preservation that all contribute to the continued cycle of intergenerational trauma and the continued rise of mental health issues in this community. The Vietnamese American community's large at-risk population further makes this a prevalent issue. So it is essential to do more research and learn more about this ethnic group in order to prevent the continued rise of mental health issues affecting this community. And in this small diagram, we can see that all four of these main points continue the cycle of intergenerational trauma. Because all of this stuff is intergenerationally transmitted from one generation to ne the next, the rise of mental health issues is perpetrated by all of these things. However, in my research, I did run into a few obstacles. One such issue was paywalls, as they make research inaccessible to many people who would have liked to read about it. In addition, research on the Vietnamese American community thus far has been minimal, and there is still much to discuss regarding this ethnic group. Further research should further explore mental health in this community in order to further raise awareness and discussion regarding these issues. In addition, while the largest concentration of Vietnamese Americans is in Orange County, California. Most research papers I found focused on the Vietnamese community in New Orleans, Louisiana. Though there is still a large Vietnamese community in New Orleans, future research should focus on communities in different states as well, in order to better represent the Vietnamese American community as a whole. Overall, a Changing these things would better raise awareness of the mental issues of and within this community, allowing for resources to become more readily available. These are some of the references I cited within my text, and thank you for listening. Thank you, Tiffany. Any questions from the attendees? Until we are waiting for their questions, I would just ask that, um, what advice would you give to another student who is just start, who is about to start their polygens journey? I think some advice I would give to another student who's starting their polygens uh, journey is, look for something you're truly passionate about because while this program, though this program is for you to pursue a passion project. So I really recommend taking advantage of that and really looking for your true passions. Because I think something about research is that the more passionate you are about a topic, the better your research on that topic will be. So don't go for something that may just be acceptable to some other people. Go for something you truly think you would enjoy because that way you will, you and your research will benefit from that passion. The next question is, what strategies can people use to break the cycle of in, inter, Jesus, sorry, intergenerational trauma? Are there ways doctors can be involved to prevent genetically transmitted stress? So some strategies people can use to break the cycle of intergenerational trauma is honestly, I think for me, the biggest one would be communication. I feel that when issues are communicated, they can be better addressed. And intergenerational trauma is not exempt from that. I think intergenerational trauma is a really big issue because it really affects people in their individual lives. It's mainly a social thing. And so being upfront about it and communicating about it will better allow people to understand that, oh, this is likely something that's 
intergenerationally an issue and that way it can be better brought up because it starts from the parents and the parents' parents and then from the offspring, it will go on to the offspring's offspring. So intergenerational trauma, I feel, is really something that depends on communication to fight it. As for whether or not doctors can be involved to prevent genetically transmitted stress, um, as far as I've seen, the issue is that, especially when, for example, a mother is pregnant with a child, let's say um, someone who was in Vietnam during the Vietnam, Vietnam War and immigrated while pregnant, that child would then have epigenetically transmitted stress from that um, stress factor. And so I don't think doctors can actually prevent genetically transmitted stress as it occurs when the mother and the parents are actually like affected themselves. And when they are affected, that goes on to their offspring. However, I do think instead of medically, not medical doctors, but for example, therapy or just being able to understand these issues and what happened, that would be a better way to kind of confront the issue of intergenerational trauma as, like I said earlier, it's mainly a social issue. Thank you, Tiffany. Now, if all the presenters could turn on their cameras, that would be great. So we are again all together. We have three minutes left. Um, do you have any questions or would you like to ask questions from each other? No, then I would like to just share one thing about your polygens experience that you will remember. Uh, maybe we can go as we started. So Olivia, Connor, Samin, and then Tiffany. Um, one thing I'll definitely remember from my polygents experience is like getting to know somebody who's already been through something that I want to do for like a living. So this is kind of my first experience with coming up with a research idea and, and going through the whole process of writing a paper. So it was very interesting. And to have a mentor was amazing because she had been through what I'm going through now. So it was kind of like giving off advice and everything. Yeah. Um, one thing I really liked about um, the Polygens project is just to be able to um, research the passion uh, a topic that I was actually passionate about. Um, I feel like um, in school, a lot of the research projects you do are very focused on the topic you're studying in class, but this was the first time where I was really able to um, pursue a project that I was truly passionate about. And I think that um, it was really fun being able to actually approach like education from this new way. One thing I'll definitely remember is that when I was starting, I had so many ideas for what I wanted my project to be. And um, my mentor really helped walk me through each of those ideas and look at the pros and cons and shed some new light on which topics that I wanted to do, which helped me eventually choose my project idea. For me, one thing I'll definitely remember from this is, like Connor said, the being able to research something I'm truly passionate about. But for me, it's not just something I'm passionate about, but also something very relevant to me. As I myself am Vietnamese American, um, it's very it was very interesting in my research to see like, oh, this is sort of what happened here and this is how it's affecting me and how intergenerational trauma is also affecting many of my friends and my community. And so this research really allowed me to sort of see how things can affect the community in a very broad sense. Amazing. This is just so amazing to hear um, all these, what you are saying about this program and how um, it's helping you really um, just to follow your passion and all of that. Um, thank you again for the great presentations. Um, Courtney message, it's not a question, but I would like to read it to you. It's uh, it's her message. Everyone did a fantastic job. What a great session. Very impressive bodies of work. And she's so right. All of you were really great. So thank you again for coming to the symposium. Thank you again for presenting. We hope that you enjoyed 
from the beginning to the end, uh, the whole process, even just getting ready for all these presentations. And then now that you presented, um, great work. We have some other sessions. Please make sure you are you support other students. Feel, feel free to join any other sessions. And also, I think we have still two panels left. Um, one of them is with mentors and the other one um, with a college um, counselor. So yeah, thank you again and and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye, everyone.